I don't know how to follow up that introduction right there. Um, back by popular demand. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. And first and foremost, I do want to thank Antonio, Alan, and everybody at AutoStar for the opportunity to be back here with you. I had an absolute blast up here last time, so it was great to be back. I also want to thank the first 15 that they asked that could not make it and said no, so I greatly appreciate them. Uh, <laughs> But seriously though guys, it is great to be back. I do think that far and above, this is the best by a software provider that there is out there. I mean, you need to give them a round of applause for providing this because nobody else does, guys. I'll tell you that right now, nobody else can do this. Am I partial to AutoStar? I was an AutoStar user back when I used to work for a living. Uh, he did mention I am currently a moderator, consultant and trainer for NCM specifically for buy here, pay here, but prior to that, uh, I was a buy here, pay here dealer for about 12 or 13 years, Northwest Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri, and prior to that, I worked for a company called Security Finance, uh, beginning in 1989. So this is the only customer that I know. This is all I've ever done. So I apologize today that your speaker has done nothing but deal with this customer, that I don't have this large, illustrious resume with different jobs. I've been dealing with the deep subprime customer for the better part of 24 years. So, a little bit about NCM before I get into what the presentation is about. We had our very first automotive 20 group meeting 65 years ago. 1947 was the very first automotive 20 group moderated by NCM, not me. In case you're wondering, it's not me, obviously. Uh, and the funny thing is, not the funny thing, but the great thing about that is, is that group is still together today. It was a group of four dealers and if you ever get the opportunity to attend one of our training classes in Kansas City, on the wall in our training room is a picture of that first 20 group, and I believe there's actually 32 members in the group uh, in the picture, but it's a really neat picture, and that group is still together today. 65 years later, that four group is still together today. I've had the privilege and honor of speaking at that group at one time in the past, so it's a pretty neat deal. We're headquartered in Overland Park, Kansas, which is a suburb of Kansas City, but if you're from the OP, they say that Kansas City is a suburb of Overland Park. So it's right there in Kansas City, and all we do is provide 20 groups, education, benchmark tools, and consulting to buy here, pay here, independent dealers, and franchise dealers. That's all we do. We don't provide capital, because there's primal in, there's professionals out there that can do that for you. We don't provide a software system, because you have somebody as well-rounded and as good as AutoStar out there. So all we do is help make dealers better. That's all we do, nothing else. Our focus is strictly on taking what it is you do and helping you improve on it to become a better dealer. So, enough about me, enough about, oh, I'm an Aquarius, by the way, and my favorite color is blue. So, all right, now, when they approached me, they said, you travel a lot, and we kind of want to theme this by Tales from the Road. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, probably fortunately for my wife and teenage daughters, unfortunately for me, I am on the road quite a bit, teaching classes, doing consulting, and working with 20 groups. And the, the number one question that I do get when I'm on the road every time and in my 20 groups is, what do they do? What do your best dealers do? What is everybody else doing? So I'm gonna theme this by what they do. In fact, I have a little contest. You can count the number of times that I say they or them in the next 45 or 50 minutes and I'll buy drinks for you tonight if you get the correct answer from six to nine only over in the exhibit hall. So whoever gets the right answer will get free drinks on me from six to nine only in the meeting hall. So, and let me kind of give you a little bit of a disclaimer when it comes to they. To me, they is not the best dealer as far as profitability, let's say, or has the best looking portfolio, or sells the most cars, or has the highest gross. To me, the best dealers I see that I work with are three things. First of all, they're very consistent in what they do. They're not all over the board. They're not this this week and this next week because this is what they heard. The second thing is, is their focus is about team. It's not if sales wins or collections wins, if we all win. And the other thing I kind of relate to them is that they're a machine. I mean, you come in, I'm fat and lazy by nature, so if I ever want to run a business, I want one that I can come into two or three days a week and it kind of runs itself. That's what I'm talking about when I say they. The dealers that I'm going to reference this afternoon during this presentation are dealers that have the most consistent businesses. They have the businesses that, are, that pretty much operate on their own. So they may not necessarily have 
the highest bottom line, or they may not have the lowest charge-offs, but their business runs very, very smoothly, and there's a reason why they do that. So, let's kick it off. The very first thing that they do very well is they do people very well. Maybe I should rephrase that. They are very good with their people. I apologize, I'm sorry, that went from PG-13 kind of out of control real quick. Um, they do people, their people is their number one asset. And earlier today, if you, were, if you said in this morning for, uh, for Alan's presentation, he said the same thing. It's people, it's good people, right? I mean, that's what makes our business as good as our people. It's not us, I mean, we're smart, right? We're good owners, we make, you know, we've done a successful business. But it's not us that's doing it. Is I mean, some of us are owner operators. I understand that you do a lot of things, but you still have other people there that run your business for us. So the first thing they do comes to hiring, and I want you to write this down because I would challenge that most of you don't have this environment in your current dealership. They hire who they want, not who they need. Now think about that for a minute. They hire who they want not who they need. Well, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is they're never in a position where they've just got to grab the next applicant that walks in the door and get them in because they're shorthanded. They typically are overstaffed a little bit, not greatly, not having 300 people when you only need 10. They don't have too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, but they're in a position that they get to hire the people they want, not the people they need. Is that important, yes or no? Sure it is, sure it is. <laughs> We get our backs against the wall and we get shorthanded. We grab the next guy that walks in the door. Why? Because his resume or his application looks good. We never take the time to make a phone call. How does that person typically work out? Right? They're a freak of nature at some point, aren't they? They just like get weird on you all of a sudden. Right? He showed up in a jacket and tie. Said yes sir, no sir. He kind of knew, you know, the lingo of the of the business. Now there's no reason for me to call him. Let's just go ahead and put him to work, and he steals money from you. So they get to hire who they want instead of who they need. The way they do that is they hire slow. You heard Alan say earlier, hire slow, fire fast. He did an article on that. A firm believer in hiring slow, being that you've got to know ahead of time, I'm gonna need somebody three months from now, so now I start looking. I have a two week process that grabs applications or resumes. I have another week process where maybe I'm verifying that. I have an interview process that says it's not just me or that direct supervisor that's going to interview that person, but I actually want at least one person that doesn't have anything to do with that job description interviewing them. Why? Because anybody can ace an interview, right? Anybody can. I mean, I can come down and sit in front of you and ace that interview, but if I get two or three other people looking at that person, talking to that person, then maybe somebody will pick up something I didn't see, and especially somebody that has no dog in the fight. So if I'm hiring a salesperson, guess who's one person that's going to interview? Probably somebody in collections, right? Maybe even my shop manager, just somebody to give me a different point of view on that person to make sure we're hiring the right person. Something else we're seeing that they do, and it's becoming a lot more prevalent now, believe it or not, is personality test. You can cheat an interview, it's pretty hard to cheat a personality test, it really is. Most of them are structured with the questions or the words that they use in there that yeah, if you're trying to fudge it, it'll show up at some point. And to kind of let me give you an example of that. Recently, uh, we had one of our 20 groups, it was my finance 20 group as a matter of fact, sign up to do a personality test for the group. Okay, I had somebody laughing already. I'm telling you, you don't, this was better than any Jerry Springer episode you could ever find because <laughs> one of them was a husband and wife. And I'll just, I don't want to go too far into this, but it was hilarious. The wife takes the test and the husband takes the test. And we had a big screen. Oh my gosh, take my picture down. You're killing them. They just ate lunch. Get rid of that. Um, the wife takes it and we take a look at it and kind of ahead of time we'd say, well, what do you think it's going to be? It was kind of an ABCD type of personality test, but uh, he said, well, I think she's going to be this, which he should as a husband, right? She's going to be this, I'm going to make sure. Well, she tested the exact opposite and it got almost uncomfortable because it's, I'm not like this and we're going, but the personality test says you are. Um, so it got a little bit funny, but we also let them, we had a two day window where they could test their entire staff. And we sent them the results, and then we had them come back to the group meeting and say, tell us what you think. Here's what they found out. They found out a third of their staff had a personality that did not fit with collections. A third. 33% of their employees were not predetermined by their personality to be collecting money from us. How do you think their portfolios perform? Probably okay. They're probably not where they needed to be. 
So that's where you can see the value of that personality test. Whether you're hiring collectors or salespeople, some of them just aren't that way. Again, I can sit in front of you and, and present that I'm the best salesperson in the world, and I'll tell you I'm a terrible salesperson. I can sell cars for a living, there's no way I'd starve, I'd be skinny, it'd be terrible. But my personality test would tell you that that's really not my strength, is selling, not direct selling. So something to, do, something to be aware of as you move forward. Do you want to hire who you want, not who you need? By want, I need to hire the person that fits that job description. I need a tech. Do I really need a personality test? Eh, probably not, not unless he's dealing with the public, right? Because if he's just working on cars all day, as far as recon, I need somebody who can turn a wrench. That's what I need. The other thing that, that's starting to pick up a little bit of steam as far as the hiring process with them, so to speak, is background checks. Uh, I don't know how many of you do that by, by show of hands that you do a background check ahead of time that you're looking for felonies or any of those kind of things. But again, they're picking the people they want, not who they need by using these processes. Because if we don't do these background checks or personality tests, whatever it says on the application or the resume is kind of what we go with. The second thing when it comes to people that they do is they do fire. And they do fire fast. I completely agree with what Alan said earlier this morning in you hire slow and you fire fast. They do not accept mediocrity. If somebody's not performing, if their sales guys aren't selling seven or eight or nine cars on a rolling three month average, hey, we appreciate your help and you're gone. If my collectors are getting a lot of complaints uh, or aren't getting through their call volume like they're supposed to, or aren't collecting their money the way they're supposed to. Hey, we appreciate what you've done. Pink copy's yours. Okay? That's what it takes moving forward. Disgruntled employees, I read this the other day, disgruntled employees in the U.S. cost companies, guess how much? Starts with a B. Ends with billions. <laughs> Billions of dollars, guys. Not hundreds of thousands, not millions, but disgruntled employees cost companies billions of dollars. And I've been there. I've been with a, hey, uh, this guy's doing a third of the job and a third of a job is better than no job. Anybody ever said that to yourself? You know, I'll take this guy. He comes in 10 minutes or 15 minutes late, but man, if I didn't have him, what am I gonna do? They don't do that. They move that person either somewhere else within the organization or they move them out, one of the two. Training is something else that they do and still to this day, I believe, is probably the most underused tool that we have as far as business owners or business run or business entrepreneurs that I think there is, is that we just do not train enough. They do. They train daily. They train weekly. They train monthly. And they do it on an ongoing basis. And their daily training isn't anything where we have to get all 37 people together in a room and we go around and we talk. It's as simple as a daily one-on-one. -on -one. Hey man, what you got going on today? What are you working on today? What are you struggling with? Have you called your missed appointments from yesterday, your broken promises? That's training. And then every week we're going over role playing, right? We're putting two people against each other and we're role playing. That's what they do consistently. I mentioned that earlier. You know, they're a team and they do things consistently in their machine. Training can't be, well, if I get to it this week, great. If not, no big deal. We won't get to be one of them if we're not training on a regular basis. Okay, now before anybody says anything in here, I don't want anybody going back to their owners and saying, hey, the spiky-haired guy said Monday afternoon, you got to pay me more money. That's not what I'm talking about with pay plans, okay? Typically, though, from an expense standpoint, those kind of dealers, or they, do typically pay a little bit more than what the average dealer might. But they're talking about employee retention. When I mean pay plan, I mean it's got to be tied to what we do, okay? I need their pay plan to maximize what my business does. I want my employees, obviously, to make a good living. I want to keep them with me for a long time because turnover kills. We all know that, right? It costs more money to hire an employee than it does to pay one another thousand dollars a month. And again, don't go back and say, Brent said, pay me another thousand dollars a month, and I'll stay. I'm talking about the pay plans are simple. Okay, they're not real complicated. You don't have to have a PhD in algorithmic algebra to figure out what my pay plan is. They're pretty simple. The other thing they are is that they are trackable by the employee. Employees hate when you hand them their pay sheet at the end of the month and go, here's your bonus, because I figured it. They want to be able to track it themselves and know how they're doing. The other thing that comes along with pay plans is benefits. I'm not really going to tackle too much of that because a lot of you probably won't have to fill Obamacare. Some of you will. You have over the 50 employees and benefits or something um, that are more of a topic than we have here. 
in the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. Last thing on here is environment that I have for something that they do when it comes to their people. I go into these dealerships and I see some of them that I would never want to work in. They're just no fun, right? It's got to be fun. I mean, think about the customers that we deal with on a daily basis. These are customers that have been, in some cases, mistreated. In some cases, rightfully so. They've asked for it. But in most cases, they're told, no, you can't, I won't. Everywhere they go. And what they're really looking for is just a little respect and courtesy. And I've been in some of these dealerships that for them, or for they, that maybe you just walk in and go, you know what, I might come out of retirement. I'm sorry, I might come out of retirement to work for this guy. It's going to be a lot of fun to work here. But they practice that and they preach that. This is a good place to work. It's about us. It's not about me as the owner making more money. Because if I make more money, everybody makes more money at that point. But it's a fun environment to work in. It's not real stressful. It's not coming down on them all the time saying we didn't sell as many cars as we were supposed to. There is a fun environment in their dealerships that I don't see with everybody. The next thing that they do is processes. And I know you guys hear this and you hear it by everybody that comes up and talks about you gotta have processes, you gotta have processes. Guess what? You gotta have processes, okay? You just do. Now, they can't be up here. They've gotta be documented. And for a couple of reasons. First of all, and probably most important, especially in our current regulatory environment, is compliance, okay? We need to have written processes that say, hey, here's how I'm going to sell a car. Here's how I'm going to follow up with this. Here's how I'm going to do that. They don't have to be every single minute of the day mapped out, but it's got to be as simple as, hey, and the first thing we do when we come in today is, if I'm a salesperson, it's call missed appointments. If I'm a collector, it's call broken promises from yesterday, right? And there's got to be a process that says, I'm going to call my delinquent accounts at one day past due. Basic processes have got to be documented. That's what they do. If you walk in, I can ask most of these dealers, can you show me your process and procedures manual? Believe it or not, it's not this thick. It's really not. I know what you're saying, Brent. Boy, if I wrote, all wrote, Brent, wrote all mine down? Can't tell I'm from Arkansas, can you? Um, if I wrote all of mine down, it would be this thick. Yeah, it would be if you went step by step, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a basic process that we can hold people accountable for and so that everybody knows what their expectations are. The other thing is, is that they implement them, <laughs> which is kind of funny actually because most of us probably have a process and procedures manual, but are you implementing it? In other words, are you expecting people to follow it or are you using it as more of a guideline? I can tell you they implement theirs and they expect compliance with that implementation. If I say this is what you're supposed to do, this is what I expect you to do, or see previous slide if we go through the firing process, okay? Last but not least, and you've heard it again, train, train, train. Just because I have the process doesn't mean it's not going to change. It will. For those of you that haven't, how many times have they changed? Quite a few, right? Things have changed. Cost of cars have gone up. Underwriting policies have changed. Collection procedures have changed. The way that we collect changes with online payments and everything else. A, a policies and procedures manual will never be complete. Those are the ones that scare me. When I hear a dealer say, here it is and it's done, I go, want to bet? because it will change, it has to. Your model is going to change over time. So they've got to be trained on it, and those dealers do train. On their weekly or on their monthly, here's our process, let's make sure that we're adhering to that process on a daily basis. And I've heard this from some, not anybody in this room yet, uh, but I've heard this from some, well Brent, I don't want to write it down because if I write it down, then I have to adhere to it. I'm better off not writing it down, then I don't have to worry about compliance. Whoa. <laughs> I don't know, well, in 50 states I know of, at least, ignorance is no excuse. So maybe there's another one out there that I'm not aware of. But processes is something that they do, and something one, outside of training that we talked about with personnel. Again, another area that I see a lot of dealers just don't take the time. What else do they do? They educate. Now, education from a couple of standpoints. They educate themselves, but they also educate their people. They do this by being members of dealer associations, TIADA, strong. I think Keith is here, and I'm not saying this because he's here. I personally think TIADA is the strongest independent dealer association that I'm aware of as far as how they communicate with their dealers, uh, what they tell you. You kind of know what rules to play by. So if you're not a member of something like TIADA, you really should be. NIADA, national associations, uh, local. I believe Houston and Dallas all have local independent dealer associations. 
These are great resources for information, and outside of your annual, it's pretty much free, right? I mean, they send you stuff on a regular basis. Hey, be looking out for this. Hey, this law is getting ready to change. I mean, it's a very, very small expense to keep you up to date on what's going on in your specific state and nationally to a certain extent when you talk about your NIADAs or NADAs. Trade publications. Now, I am not allowed by my job description with NCM to endorse or recommend products, but I'm going to break that rule. And my boss is here too, so maybe hopefully he's not in here right now, but don't tell him I said this. Um, if you're not getting a publication called Spot Delivery, get it. Very simply. I'm not paid by Spot Delivery in any way or Hudson Cook, but I'm telling you that back when I used to work for a living, I paid for it. It's $300 a year, and from a compliance standpoint, guys, it is absolutely huge. It is. If you're not getting that, you need to write that down on your to-do list. Go back and get it right away because it brings you up to date, especially with the CFPB. It's bringing you up to date with that. Uh, and it may not be anything specific to you, but each month, and I think there's 10 of them a year, 11 of them a year is what you get. Each month there are case law in there from different states. Now it may not be yours, but it gives you an idea of what's going on in the regulatory environment around you. What other dealers are getting in trouble for, right? Um, used car news, subprime, I'll go through these. And those are free if I remember right. Uh, Auto dealer monthly, all of these you should be getting. But here's the trick to it. You kind of got to read it, okay? <laughs> I, I know you're laughing, and I'm kind of bad about it. I'll get a bunch of them in a week, and I'll take them with me on the road, and I kind of get through them, but sometimes I don't get through them until the next edition comes out in some cases. But, and you laugh, but I see these on dealer's desk every day, and I see two- and three-month-old versions of these sitting on their desk still. The other key to these publications is get them into the hands of your people. Okay? Information is power. Let your people read what's going on out there so they understand what's happening in the environment. They do this. They pass them around. Make sure that everybody reads them. I'm not saying go through a whole test process. Hey, here's subprime news. Read that. There's going to be a test next week. No. But get it in their hands. It makes them feel involved so they can know what's going on in the world around them. I do quite a bit of collections and sales training. And one thing that I always hear is, well, you don't know what it's like where we are. I can promise you that the customer in Seattle, Washington looks exactly like the customer in Portland, Maine. But your staff is out there thinking it's just us that's seeing these. Trace publications is one way to help them understand that, hey, there's more people out there. The other thing is, you're doing it right now. You're here. So when it comes to your what they do checklist, you can check off the conferences and conventions because you're here. And this is not only just for your software, but obviously they've expanded this now, so it is kind of an industry-wide deal. As many of these as you can go to, I'm not saying go to all of them, but as many of them as you can go to, it's worth their weight in gold to attend these. That's where they are. And most of you here have seen each other. I see it uh, over in the exhibit hall. I see some of you. I saw you here, even though you're not even in the same town, you still recognize each other from other conventions. The networking alone is worth the price of admission. Just to be around other dealers and hear what they do is worth the price of admission. Not saying you have to go back and do it. Um, and one thing I'll kind of go back to something I should have mentioned originally when I was talking about they. Guys, I'm not here to say this is what you should be doing. Okay? Anybody that's a vendor or a consultant in this industry that comes to you and says this is the way that you should do it, run. Because there's a million ways to do this business right. What works in Fort Worth, Texas may not work in Barton, Maryland, or Seattle, Washington. It's good guidelines to see what everybody else is doing, but there is no buy here, pay here in a box. There is no silver bullet to this, and don't let anybody at a convention or conference tell you there is because it just ain't so. There's a thousand ways that you're all successful, you wouldn't be here. If you weren't making money, where would you be? Back there working, right? Not here, but you're making money, so you're successful. Consulting in 20 groups, I'm not going to do a shameless plug here. What I mean by this is it's always good to have another set of eyes. I talked earlier about the hiring process and when we interview, maybe we want to have somebody interview that person that has no dog in the fight whatsoever, right? Because they have, I just want to see what it's like. This is what I mean with consulting or 20 groups. This gets you around people that aren't affiliated with you directly and gets you a new set of eyes to take a look at what's really going on in your business. Uh, I had the, the pleasure and honor of being up here on a debate with with Chuck, and this was one thing that I think was good for everybody to see is that here's what we look at as consultants when we come out to your dealership. 
It's not about us coming out and telling you what you should be doing. Here's how you have to do your job. It's taking a look at your business, and we look at things that you don't look at on a daily basis. You may look at how much money you're collecting. You may look at this, but typically somebody like that, or even in a 20 group, the composite that they have and the opportunity you have to look at numbers, they're numbers that you don't look at on a regular basis. So you get the opportunity to look at your business in a new light and then compare it against somebody else. And again, it's not, I'm going to chase their model. I'm not saying go and do this because he does this. He underwrites this way. He asks for $300 down payments. Well, you should do $300 down payments. We're not saying that. It's just another way to take a look at your business. All right. Technology. Well, I'll tell you what. I can't keep up with it anymore. My teenage daughter showed me how to use my iPhone. I never had one before. We got them a couple of months ago. And I just looked at it and went, oh, my God. What do you do with this thing? Where's the, where's the buttons? How do you get this thing to work? But technology in this day and age is a must. You have got to stay up with it or you will get left behind. They invest money in their DMS, obviously. You guys have done a great job with that, right? Auto Star, everybody happy with your DMS, I'm sure. Uh, Alan said something this morning I thought was very interesting and actually the number was a little bit lower than what I thought. And he said that the average dealer on Auto Star only uses 50% of it. That kind of really took me back a little bit. I thought, wow, 50% of it. I thought maybe it'd be a little bit higher. 65, 75, maybe 80%. But he said 50% of it. Now, if that's the case with you, if you don't get that software more than 50% of it, then you definitely need to be here to learn more about it. They know how to take advantage of their software. They know the ins and outs. They've taken the time, spent the money to either have somebody come in and train them, or kind of the way we used to do it in the old days, you just started hitting buttons and running reports to see what happened, right? But you never hit print, right? Because the first time you hit print, it was one of those things that printed out like every customer you ever had, period, and just keep running paper and running paper and running paper. But your DMS, my personal feeling is it's on the cutting edge of technology, and it is above the others in that respect. But yes, Antonio, I am Switzerland uh, by my job description. So you guys have already invested in that. Your websites. This one is, we're getting better, but I can tell you what they do as far as their websites are concerned. Their websites are effective. And what I mean by effective is they sell cars. They get people in the door. The website itself doesn't sell the car, but what the website does is generate a lead. And the reason that they're very effective with their websites is because they actually track them and know. They use a free Google Analytics, if you're not using that, free. Sign up and it'll tell you a whole bunch of information in there, probably more than you need to know. But they're monitoring their websites, they're changing their websites, and their websites are generating leads, which is really all we want our website to do, because it can't sell the car, right? They still have to physically come in the dealership, I think for most of you anyway. They still have to come physically into the dealership and sign paperwork before they leave with the vehicle. So their websites aren't about selling cars, their websites are about capturing your contact information and then setting up an appointment and getting you in to sell their cars. Also, they have the ability to make payments on them. And again, with portal pay and some other things, I'm sure you guys probably have those kinds. And we can check that one off our what they do to get to, uh, to get to that kind of a dealer. The internet. Never thought it was going to catch on personally. I mean, some of you may be like me and are old enough to remember the Prodigy days when it first came out, when it was basically, oh, the Britannia encyclopedia was pretty much all it was on the website and you always had to dial up into it and you always got knocked off and you're sitting there going well this thing's never going to catch on nobody's ever going to want any part of this i guess it's pretty much here to stay now what they do with the internet may be a little bit different from what you're using it for obviously we use it for all the same things we do use it for collections right probably the main thing you look at it for but they're buying cars online they're researching where to buy cars online. They're not just using it as a skip tracing tool. They're using it to do the background checks on employees. They're using it for the personality test. They're using it for a myriad of things that most of us just say, well, it's just for skip tracing. I just want Facebook. I just want master files. I just want that part of it. And I restrict everybody else's usage. From an underwriting standpoint, they're using it as a way to get the information they need to verify employment. Customer never leaves the dealership, walks in, I don't have a pay stub with me, I don't have a utility bill. Great, do you have a bank account? Sure, what are we gonna do? Set them up for online banking right then and there while they're sitting in front of me, print off my, my uh, bank statements to my heart's content. Well, have you ever paid your electric bill online? 
No, because they've never paid it anyway, right? Well, they have, but uh, have you ever paid your utility bill online? No, great, we can set that up for you. Print off past utility bills to our heart's content while they're sitting right there in the dealership with us and never have to leave. That's what they're doing with the internet. They're not just looking at it as a tool just to collect or maybe even just to source cars. They're looking at it as a way to, go, to gather all the information that they need to run their business. All right, the plan. Last but not least is the plan. Now, when we're talking about the plan, the plan that they have is not, I'm gonna sell some cars and collect some money. I'll just tell you that now. So if that's your plan, we're not quite to the they stage yet. We might wanna get a little bit more in depth with our plan than that. First thing that they do is they do have a cash flow plan. Um, and I get this a lot. Well, man, that's just too much. I don't know if I want, I don't think I can figure out my own cash flow plan. Uh, do I have to pay somebody to come in and do it? Uh, we can do a quick exercise. I think we have done this before, but I can do I can do a cash flow plan for you right here and now while we're standing here. It takes about five minutes to do it. We very simply just say, let's say your average ACV is fifty five hundred dollars. It's about average fifty seven somewhere in the six grand range, <coughs> and average down payments a thousand bucks. So fifty five minus a thousand would be forty five. But I got sales tax and some other costs in there, so I kind of got to add those back. Uh, because that comes out right away. So my cash in deal is five grand. I'm selling 50 cars a month, so five grand times 50, you do the math, is what, 250 grand, right? Somebody check my math, because that may not be right. Uh, $250,000, and I know that my average monthly expenses are a thousand, I mean $100,000, right? And this is a pretty good sized dealer, obviously. So that's $350,000. Here's my cash flow. How much do I gotta collect? $350,000, bingo. There's a free cash flow for you right there. That's how I know if I'm cash flowing. Am I collecting enough money to cover what I've got spent? Now, obviously I would not run your business off of that cash flow model specifically. And Dave Keller, if you're in the room, I apologize because I know it should be a lot more in depth than that. And it really should be. But you have to know what your cash needs are gonna be. I don't care if you're wanting to grow or not. They know what their cash flow is. Even if I've got some of the dealers that are listed in this day that are 20 cars a month and don't wanna be the next drive time. But they still know how much capital it's gonna to take to operate their business so they know whether or not they're gonna to have to borrow money at some point. Inventory. Tax time, right? It's time to be buying inventory. They buy their tax time inventory year around. In this day and age, that's what they're doing. They're not waiting till September and October and November and December to start buying their inventory. They're actually looking at how, what their inventory was going to be for 2014 as soon as 2013's tax season was done. I need 300 cars on my lot by January 1, reconned and ready. It's May 1st. That gives me seven more months to buy cars, so i got to divide that seven. That's what they do. They backed it up because of the cost of cars and the availability of those cars. They've also planned out what their reconditioning is going to be on those cars, so they kind of know what the ACV is going to be at that time. Um, the days of waiting until the last three or four months for tax season to, uh, to buy your inventory, we're just running those car costs up even more than we have in the past. They're planning for their sales. Pretty simple. They're saying, hey, this year I sold this many, next year I want to sell this many. Now, all of these things that I'm going to talk about with the plan come back to one key component, and it's got to make sense. We did an exercise with the group, and I'm going to go ahead and put collections up here, and I'll talk about these a little bit more in detail in just a second. But we did an exercise in January this year with all of our 20 groups where all I had them submit to me was how many cars are you going to sell each month, how many cars are you going to charge off each month? And how many cars do you think, how many accounts are you going to think are going to pay off? That's all I had them send me. And they had to send it to me January through December. That's all we did. Just send me that. And then I took that and we put it into a kind of a cash flow model to tie this back to that. But then what I did is I took what they had done for the last three years for each one of those months, for each one of the things that they gave me. But they didn't know that. So when we got to the 20 group meeting, we, it was uh, one dealer's time, I said, okay, tell me about this, here's your plan. And up on the board, I had their, the top half of a spreadsheet that showed what they had projected on there. Hey, that looks great. Gonna sell 25% more cars, gonna charge off 10% less, and we're gonna go pay off by 5%. 
Man, that's great. Look at how much cash at the end of the year I got. Well, we're doing great. But at the bottom of it, I showed him what his three-year averages were for every one of those. Take a guess on how many dealers' three-year history matched up with what they were going to do in one year. Zip. Not one. Not one of all of our 20 groups. It wasn't not one of one group. It was not one of any of them. Their three-year history was anywhere close to what they were projecting for this year. So we had a very simple question for them. <laughs> what are you going to do different? What do you think they said? Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. Does anybody know the definition of insanity? Can somebody tell me that one real quick? What is it? Doing the same things over and over and expecting a different result. That's what I'm talking about when it comes back to the plan. That's what they do. They look at it and say, okay, for the last whatever it is, and it may not it doesn't necessarily have to be on a specifically on a monthly basis. Okay? It can be on an annual basis. I want to sell 200 cars next year. But if I've never done that, is there anything that's changed or is going to change in our environment that's going to make me or give me the ability to do that? And it was. To the dealer, and again, these are quite a few dealers and some very intelligent dealers, here's three years. What, what's changed? How are you going to stop charge-offs? Uh, just not going to repossess as fast. <laughs> okay, great. Can you kind of give me a little bit more with that? How's that going to work for you? Uh, you're stopping payoffs by 5%. What are we going to do? Uh, I don't know. We're going to repeat, I guess. Okay, great. What's the plan? Give me something here. And again, guys, some of these were dealers that you would take a look at. $100 million portfolios. Not, I mean, I know what some of you are saying. Well, Grant, I'm sure that's the little, you know, probably the small mom and pop guy. No, these were very large operations that had that kind of a plan. Obviously, they didn't make it into the day. Going back to inventory, since I brought up repossession, some of them have actually, and again, it's kind of the way things are going right now, but what they're doing is they are accelerating repossession times to increase their inventories because inventory is so hard to buy. Now, that is kind of dangerous to a certain extent, but it is what they're doing. It's hard to find that four, three, four, five thousand dollar $5,000 car that's not going to be a seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 car after reconditioning. So they're taking a look at you know, it's a good unit, customer's really struggling, maybe we should just go ahead and call the spade a spade, and why don't you go ahead and give me that back and I'll put it back out on the lot. Uh, we talked about their sales plans, their collection plans aren't simply, I want to reduce charge offs, or I want to increase dollars collected. They're taking a look at that and going, here's what I should be expect out of this collection department. We talked about the hiring of people, we talked about the team environment. They're keeping their people involved with these. What they do is they hand a blank piece of paper to the sales manager and they say, yo, sales manager, fill it out. Tell me what you think you can do this year. And they do the same thing with their collection manager. Here's a blank piece of paper. Write on here. Tell me, what do you think you're going to collect? What do you think you're going to charge off? Okay? They hand it to them and then get it back and they get the buy-in from them. So everybody's involved in the decision-making process. I'm actually going to finish a little bit early. I apologize about that. It is time to be one of them. How many of you are ready to be one of them? How many of you get to hire who you want, not who you need? Anybody out there have that one right now? That's the first one, I think. That's the key to being one of them is you get to hire who you want, not who you need. How many of you are firing fast? Or how many of you are hanging on to 33% employee? or 25% employee. How many of you are training on a regular basis? I don't mean, well, we kind of do it every now and then. I mean something daily, something weekly, something monthly. How many of you are doing that currently? Because that's what they do. How many of your pay plans are easy to understand? How many of your pay plans can I come in off the street and understand, first of all, how it's calculated, and secondly, how many of you have pay plans that I would have direct control over, regardless of what it is? Because if they don't have control over it, they don't understand it, they won't believe in it, and they won't work the plan. And that's exactly what I want them to do when it comes to the pay plan. I want them to work that pay plan. That's what I want them to do. But I've got to structure that pay plan so that I make more than they do <laughs> at that point from a business standpoint. And how many of you as environments, have you ever taken a look at that? How many of your environments, when you come in, is this a place that you would like to work? Or another way to do this is maybe have... Uh, a fellow dealer that you know, maybe through a 20 group or whatever, uh, come in and ask. Ask them. 
Ask somebody, ask a neighbor or a friend, hey, come in my dealership and, and mystery shop me and tell me, what do you think? Mystery shopping is something I didn't mention earlier when, when I was talking about environment, but if you're not doing that to yourself, I know a lot of dealers that mystery shop their competition, but they mystery shop themselves. You know, we talked about having a consultant come in. Why? Because what I like to do when I come in, especially from an environment standpoint, is I want to talk to the employees. I never want to talk to you as the owner. I don't. That's not what I'm there for. What I want to do is I want to talk to your people and I want to talk to them by themselves. And all the thing I want you to tell them is just be completely honest with them. And I never give anybody up when I, when I hear something negative. I just simply tell the owner or general manager, here's what I heard. But they're typically going to be more honest with me than they are you, so you should mystery shop yourself to make sure it is a fun environment to work in. If you have a high turnover rate, you've probably missed three or four of those top ones that I already talked about. You probably didn't hire right, you didn't fire fast enough. Pay plan doesn't make any sense, we're not training them, or they just don't like working there, one of the three. Second thing we talked about were processes. Document them, guys. I'm, I'm not a believer in, and an attorney will tell you the same thing, you really do need it in writing because it will help. Now I've had uh, OSHA inspector, a former OSHA inspector, come to a 20 group meeting and speak to us about compliance from an OSHA standpoint. And what she told us simply was, you'll never be 100% compliant. You can't. There's no way. There's just too much out there. But what we do like to see is an attempt. And they attempt to be compliant by having the processes and procedures documented. Come in and say, well, here's what we tell them they're supposed to do, but we can't control it. Second thing they do is they obviously implement those processes. They make sure that people are doing them on a regular basis, and if they're not, they take the corrective active actions for those. And again, they train on them because they are going to change. With everything that's going on regulatory and just in the business world period with our model, they are going to change. Again, what scares me is when I hear somebody say, there's my PNP, and it's done. Nope, it's done for today. But next week, that's going to change. We talked about education. We talked about educating not only yourself through dealer associations, uh, trade publications, conventions and conferences, consulting in 20 groups, but your people as well. When I do some of these classes, the one thing I really enjoy is that I, get, I call back and somebody says, well, how do they do? You know, man, they were great. She was really enthused and she spoke up and she participated. Man, that's crazy because here she just kind of sits at her desk and doesn't say a whole lot. Some cases, the best thing to motivate your people is just let them get out for a little while. That's what they do. They send people to innovate. They send people to classes. Um, what else did we talk about when it came to, we talked about technology. We talked about that you have to be on the cutting edge. You have to stay up with what's going on or you will get left behind. We talked about your DMS. Obviously, you guys have that covered. Check that one off. Now you're one of them because you've got a good DMS. The question is, are you using more than 50% of it? And if you're not, there's a lot of doors out there that are open to figure out ways to take up more than 50% of it. You guys have that opportunity. And again, I'll tell you, nobody else does this. None of the other software companies do this. Why? I don't know. But they don't. And we're not going to tell them. Right? But you have the perfect opportunity here to learn about it. And you've got a captive audience when you, when you do get to learn about it. We talked about your websites. The days of just having a website are not good enough anymore. They just aren't. Okay? Everybody has a website. There was a survey done by Auto Trader. They did it this summer. They did it last summer. The numbers came out pretty much the same, and this may blow your mind if you haven't seen it, but 80% of the buy here, pay here customers have done some to significant research online before buying. 80%. If you're like me, you can figure our customer can't even spell internet, right? And they can't be online. And what are they online with? Is it a laptop? No. It's a smartphone, right? They've got iPads, smartphones. That's what they're online with. So your website can't just be the basic website from a laptop. It's got to be mobile because they're not looking at it on a laptop. They're looking at it on that little four and a half inch screen. And if it doesn't fit on there, what do you think they're going to do? Click. They're going to go somewhere else. They have their websites as mobile apps so you can get to them. Uh, the last thing we talked about, obviously, when it came to technology was the internet part of it, um, that it's just not a collections tool anymore. It is a way to satisfy stipulations in underwriting. It's a way to buy cars. It is a great way to skip trace, right? Facebook, everybody agreed, number one skip tracing site out there. Why? Because our customers will just tell you everything, won't they? I'm here, I'm going there, I've been here, they're tweeting, right? Can't make my car payment, but by gosh, we can be out there on Facebook, right? I mean, that just, anybody, 
and again, kind of getting off subject here a little bit, but you know the average amount of time spent on Facebook? 2.5 hours. Every time somebody logs in, they're on Facebook. Two point, how crazy is that? Anybody in here have 2.5 hours to just kind of sit around and look at likes and posts and all that kind of stuff? Our customer does. They do because they're out there for 2.5 hours. So again, you've got to have these presences as part of your internet. Uh, is Facebook going to sell you a car? Some experts will say yes it will. I don't know that Facebook in and of itself will sell you a car, but what they do is they do have their business page. Their business page is updated. I've seen some of them where the latest post was from a year and a half ago. There's no reason. They have somebody updating it on at least a weekly basis. Some of them do tweet. I don't even know how to tweet. I don't even, I don't even have a Facebook page. Am I the only one that doesn't have a Facebook page? Anybody else here not have a Facebook page? Am I the only one? I'm probably the only one. So I don't know what tweeting is, but evidently we do it and we follow a bunch of people with it. They do tweet. Um, the next thing we talked about was the plan. The last thing we talked about was the plan. I didn't put it last because I think it's the least important. It's just these are kind of importance of the order in which when I'm working with these dealers that they have that part of it. I do think, like Alan said earlier this morning, and I completely agree with that, people are the number one thing that we have got to have to be successful. Okay? The rest of these things we need to do to become one of them, to be a they, but people is really where it starts. And then our processes from there, because that develops our people, our educating, keeps our people involved, our technology gives them the tools to do what they do, and therefore the plan pretty much takes care of itself at that point. Right? But you do have to have a plan. Again, it doesn't have to be a long drawn out, and I don't, I don't agree with dealers that do have three and five and six year cash flow plans. Why? Because if I sell five more cars this month, what does that do to the next four and a half years? Messes it up, right? It changes it completely. You know, a cash flow model works if I'm going to sell 20 cars a month every single month from here on out. But you do need to know as a business what kind of cash that you're going to need. We talked about a plan for our inventory. When is it time to start to buy? They are buying now and have been buying for at least three or four months for tax season for next year. They don't wait till September, October, November. They're typically done by December 1. They have all the cars they need for their tax season by December 1. Why? Because when do prices start going up mostly? Usually in December and January. They have a plan for their sales and their plan makes sense. We talked about the exercise that we did where zip zero nada dealer three-year plan or three-year history matched what they said they were going to do and remember the plan that they had what they were going to do remember what that was what that plan was it's a solid one nothing that's our plan in uthin that's how i'm going to change things i'm going to do nothing differently and collections was the same way because charge offs and paid outs were tied into that so all of that came back to the plan again thank you very very much i appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, this is an ex absolute blast for me. I enjoyed doing this. I hope I can come back again. We're in booths. We're need. We don't need our booths. I know our booths. Uh, our booths are 31 and 32. We are giving away a mini iPad, and we have some scratch-off stuff for some free uh, for, for some consulting dollars uh, for some 20 group uh, dues as well over there. There's our website. There's my contact information. If you guys want to write this down, let me give you. Hang on. Let me give you my cell phone number real quick. Since it's not on here, if you guys want to write this down, I love talking by here, pay here, guys. I mean, I think I have the greatest job in the world. I travel the country. I get to stay in nice places, and I talk by here, pay here for a living. I don't think I'm ever going to go back to work for a living. I think I'm going to keep doing this. But if you want my cell phone number, I'll give it to you. It's area code 913-708-5976. If I don't answer your call, I'm with a client or in a 20 group, but I guarantee you I will. Again, AutoStar, thank you very much, everybody here at Innovate 13. Thank you very much.